Hello, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a 30-year-old male who came in with change in mental status and fever. And here are the T1-weighted sagittal images. You can tell it's T1 because the soft tissues have mildly increased signal and the CSF is dark. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a look through all of these sagittal images. We go from left to right, okay, back from right to left, and you see an area of abnormal signal intensity here in the left hemisphere, and this involves occipital lobe and a little bit of posterior temporal lobe. Okay, so you can see this heterogeneous area of low signal intensity, a portion of it which appears relatively confluent and of fairly uniform low signal intensity, and the other is a little more heterogeneous. How do I know it's primarily in the occipital lobe? Well, the occipital lobe is back here posteriorly, and we have the convenience of being able to go into the midline sagittal images and on the left side that's kind of disturbed by this lesion but you can see this little line right here which is the parieto occipital fissure if you don't believe me we can look on the other side and and see it more clearly and here it is on the contralateral side parieto occipital fissure that means parietal lobe is, is here and occipital lobe is here. So going back to the affected side you can see it's really predominantly in the occipital lobe and the parieto occipital fissure which we ordinarily would see here is largely effaced. Okay and we have this confluent area so we're thinking in a patient that's young and has altered mental status and fever of an infectious process, not typical of a tumor. Now in a different setting, we might be thinking about tumor as a possibility, but we have a number of pulse sequences to go to here that can help us. Now here's a T2-weighted image. This shows bright signal in the center of what has of what appears to be a lesion with a relatively thick wall and fluid signal around it so you have some type of fluid in here it appears since it's so uniformly bright you have fluid outside the lesion which i presume is edema and you have some kind of capsule here that's of intermediate to low signal intensity Okay, so we're thinking about infection. Here we have a well demarcated lesion with probably a capsule, fluid centrally, and edema surrounding it. That is very suspicious for an abscess. If we look at it on the T1 weighted image, we see more clearly than we did on the sagittal that there is a central fluid containing compartment and there's really quite intense edema surrounding it, which is why it looked so bright on T2 as if it were frank fluid, for example, here. So edema can look a little bit grayer and not quite as bright as this, but this is extremely uniform bright signal on T2 weighted images, which indicates it's severe edema. Doesn't, as, it's not as far reaching as some cases that we see, but it's still very intense, okay? The capsule probably has some fibrous tissue and that's what's giving it this dark perimeter, low signal perimeter. All right, let's take a look at this in the coronal plane. And here you can see it has a more oblong configuration, is involving the posterior left temporal lobe and as we've noted before, a large portion of the left occipital lobe. 
Here again you see a low signal intensity perimeter which is not typical of many tumors and so in this case it's a fibrous capsule I would suspect in an abscess with intermediate signal intensity on this flare coronal image and edema around it. Now in diffusion weighted images we see bright signal in the lesion but very importantly and characteristic of abscesses we have low signal on what are called ADC images. ADC images being one of the components of a diffusion sequence. So these are also diffusion images but they are specifically the ADC images from the diffusion sequence. And so this characteristic of restricted diffusion and therefore low signal on ADC images is characteristic of abscesses and very very few other things. So for the most part with this history we have made a diagnosis with certainty of an abscess. Here we see a gradient recall echo, GRE images, which are T2-like, but that also show the bright signal centrally and very nicely define the capsule around this abscess, which is characteristic of well-developed abscesses. Now this looks like a horrendous lesion and can be very worrisome at first for a tumor but these ADC images really put us in a comfort zone saying this is an abscess we can go in and drain that and neurosurgery would probably drain it uh, and a, a drainage of this collection here would probably be therapeutic and a drain would be left in place for some period of time to make sure that any remaining infection continues to drain while this all heals. So an excellent example of a brain abscess, very rare. One would have to think about HIV as an underlying baseline medical condition leading to this. Uh, we don't see any other lesions to suggest a toxoplasmosis or any other brain infections. So here we have a brain abscess and this is also a wonderful opportunity to review some of the anatomy. So going through the midline here, here is the corpus callosum. This is all body of the corpus callosum. The splenium of the corpus callosum is this swelling posteriorly. The genu is this G is rather this knee-shaped component anteriorly and the rostrum is this little triangular down-pointing component. So the corpus callosum, a huge structure containing millions and millions of fibers that are crossing from one hemisphere to the other. The other place we saw fibers crossing from one side to the other is here in the pons. In fact the pons, pons is Latin for bridge and that's because fibers from one side of the brain are going to the other since the cerebellar hemispheres represent the body and parts of the body ipsilaterally whereas the cerebral hemisphere represent them contralaterally. So this pons, this bridge is kind of a reconciliation between those disparate uh, anatomic facts that pertain to the cerebral hemispheres having ipsilateral, I'm sorry, the, the cerebral hemispheres having contralateral communication with the body and the cerebellum having ipsilateral representation of various parts of the body. So this also gives us a nice view of the
midbrain. The midbrain includes this portion. This is the quadrigeminal plate, which has superior and inferior colliculi, two superior and two inferior colliculi, and we only see a bump representing basically both superior and both inferior colliculi since the slice is relatively thick. Here's the pons, and here we have the medulla, the cerebellum, and these are portions of the cerebellar vermis, these little branching structures. Here's the cella tersica, and the cella tersica is characterized by containing typically a small amount of fluid, a small pituitary gland inferiorly, and, and a pituitary infundibulum, which goes from this region right here, which is where the thalamus is located. I'm sorry, this region right here where the hypothalamus is located. This structure here is the thalamus and it is largely a relay station of sensation and sensory modalities en route to the hemisphere. The hemispheres and uh, the cerebral areas representing sensation, vision, touch, and such. Okay, the cella tersica is immediately inferior to the optic chiasm and we are seeing a portion of the optic chiasm here and if we go off to the right we see the optic nerve going forward toward the eyeball. There's a little bit of it there and then it enters the globe, the posterior part of the globe. Okay, so here we have the cella containing the pituitary gland and the pituitary infundibulum coming down from this area, the hypothalamus, which regulates the release of hormones from the pituitary. Optic chiasm sitting on top of the cella tersica. Here you see some dark signal, which is flow void within the basilar artery. Here you have the thalamus, a relay nucleus for sensory information to the cerebral cortex. Here you have the corpus callosum, a large structure containing millions of fibers crossing from one side of the brain to the other, cerebellum, and in the midline you have the cerebellar vermis, which has this appearance of kind of like ferns, the fern leaves. Here you have the midbrain right here, which has the quadrigeminal plate and therefore the overlying cistern containing CSF, which is the quadrigeminal cistern. Remember that the quadrigeminal plate contains superior and inferior colliculi. Superior colliculi a rudimentary structure of little importance in people but involved in vision and the inferior colliculi being important relay nuclei of auditory stimuli, stimuli from the ears and uh, an integral part of the auditory system in the human. Here you have the medulla coursing inferiorly here, this narrow structure here, and it is medulla until you get to the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is that uh, very esoteric Latin term which means big hole. And this big hole, the foramen magnum, is an arbitrary level at which we no longer refer to the central nervous system as medulla, but below that it is the spinal cord by definition. So you have cervical cord below the level of the foramen magnum and medulla above the level of the foramen magnum as the caudal most portion of the brain stem. The brain stem generally referring to all of this structure, the medulla, pons, midbrain, and variably the thalamus. The hypothalamus is present here more anteriorly.
And here you have the nasal structures and nasal passages, a little bit of the tongue here. On one side here you can see the sylvian fissure. Go to the other side, sylvian fissure. Inferior to that is temporal lobe. So you can see this lesion while certainly within the occipital lobe has edema that encroaches into the temporal lobe and be familiar with this because this is the parietal occipital fissure and that allows you to determine where the parietal lobe stops and the occipital lobe begins and you know from my lecture on the cingulate sulcus that the cingulate sulcus shows where the central sulcus is which helps you divide the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe and then we have this slam dunk easy fissure the sylvian fissure which separates the upper hemisphere both frontal and a portion of the parietal lobe from the temporal lobe but it certainly clearly demarcates the temporal lobe okay so once again patient with abscess fluid containing structure with a fibrous rim and ADC images showing the characteristic restricted diffusion of an abscess.